Okay, so starting out in the mode of a TED Talk or something without a, a screen, um, talking about climate change and risk analysis. Um, for something like 40 years, um, scientists have been urging politicians to reduce carbon dioxide emissions because carbon dioxide is greenhouse gas and holds infrared radiation in the lower atmosphere. Um, and that causes heating. If you have more energy coming in in the way of sunlight than is going out um, in terms of infrared, then the planet is absorbing energy. Now, it can do multiple things. It can heat the surface. It can melt ice, which doesn't necessarily heat the surface. Um, and the heating will cause um, changes in weather patterns. And those changes in weather patterns um, tend to be of increased energy because the oceans are warmer. Um, so because of climate change, which are the effects of the warming of the earth or the increase in energy in the atmosphere at the earth, atmosphere and ocean of the earth um, will have changed rain patterns some places that were getting rain before may not get rain now and others may um, start getting rain but that isn't always good for crops because the soil type may be different where the rain moves to um, the weather will often be more extreme um, simply because it is running at a higher energy level. Uh, the oceans are warmer where hurricanes um, start out. And as Phil says, many species do not adapt quickly, um, including humans. Um, which is true. The other thing that's going on is rising sea levels from essentially two factors. One is as the ocean warms, it expands, and that's going to rise the, uh, raise the sea level. Um, also, ice is melting. It's melting in the glaciers, and it's melting um, at the poles. And both of those are going raise sea level, and they're not going raise sea level equally over the whole ocean because of wind patterns um, and ocean currents. And then the other factor, since the planet is increasing energy, is a rising global annual average temperature. Now, 40 years ago, people were saying, um, you know, let's reduce carbon emissions. And to a large extent, that's been ignored, particularly ignored in the United States. Um, some of that has been happening, however, just through private effort. But we're still on a um, increase in CO2. I think the current level is about 418 parts per million, where pre-industrial was 220, uh, 285 about. Um, and the effects of that increase in CO2 and something like a one degree increase over that period, one degree Celsius, uh, in temperature are having their effects. Now, one of the effect is the poles tend to heat two to three times faster than the global mean temperature. So um, if that's one degree heating in the global mean, global annual mean, that can easily be 
two degrees temperature um, at the poles, which sort of gets us into Texas. Um, I don't know about how effective carbon trading has been. Different topic, but um, if the poles are warming faster than the average temperature, that means the tropical to pole um, temperature change is becoming less. And that means the um, exchange or transfer of energy from the tropics to the poles um, isn't as large. And it's that transfer of energy and the weather patterns associated with it that drive the polar vortex and make that polar vortex stronger. So with climate change, the polar vortex, the... Um, winds around the pole that tend to keep the Arctic air locked up near the poles, um, that circulation becomes weaker. So if the jet stream hits the polar vortex and then dips south, what it tends to do is break the polar vortex, which is exactly what we've been seeing um, down to Texas that what happens is the cold polar air heads south and places like, uh, well, this time it's in the mid of the United States, um, and places like Alaska and Greenland are seeing these warm temperatures and people in Greenland are complaining that it's harder to get around on their snowmobile because the ice is turning into slush. Sure, sometimes uh, Europe will see that too. The outbreak of polar air can, in fact, split in two or three. So it's not always just uh, one. If you think about that, that's exactly the way that waves are, that they oscillate up and down. So if we have a down oscillation in the mid-United States, we have can easily have up oscillations um, in Greenland and in Alaska, and then a further down oscillation, uh, down being south. Now, Texas is an interesting case, um, not only because they got a very um, unexpected amount of Arctic air, and it was colder than um, had been estimated uh, would occur, um, they also were planning on the peak energy needs for summer, which is a, the general case because of air conditioning, and in fact had some of the electric generators offline um, getting prepped for summer. Additionally, El Paso did fine. El Paso seems to be unique in being hooked up to the larger country electric grid. Whereas Texas um, predominantly is an isolated grid all by itself. So when their generators lost capacity, they didn't have any network, that, um, any larger network they could draw from. Yes, as uh, Sumo says, yes, El Paso is on the national grid. Um, So that was a problem. Um, nothing was winterized. Um, the natural gas lines in particular weren't winterized. 
um, there was a small amount of, uh, which was the pr predominant power loss, there was a small um, amount of uh, wind, en wind energy lost because the um, turbines weren't winterized, but that was a relatively small uh, addition to the overall power loss in Texas. Now, interesting that about 10 years ago, another uh, cold episode had had it, had happened, and the um, national government called on Texas to um, add winterization, which got ignored because uh, because it's totally an in-state um, electric grid, the federal government does not have any authority to mandate um, changes. And of course, this is exactly what Texas was trying to avoid, having uh, the federal government have any say in their electric affairs. So it was a perfect setup of insufficient planning, um, not anticipating the severe effects of climate change in helping to bring polar air down into Texas, and um, not being prepared for the cold. Now, um, I have one reference that uh, notes that it was planning for uh, low cost rather than planning for reliability. Well, they knew they knew it would be colder. They didn't know it would be as cold, um, and they didn't. And from what I've read, they didn't anticipate that the increase in demand would be as large as it was. And yeah, it happened before. It happened something like ten years ago. Um, another example. Uh, another example of um, where good planning was avoided, uh, was ignored, um, was in the Himalayas. And um, officials ignored expertise, saying that it was not a good idea to build hydro. Um, dam plants uh, in that fragile an area, but went ahead, built a hydroelectric plants, and in doing so, stimulated a flash flood off of the glacier um, that had been melting, um, wiping out the dams. Um, something like 26 people were known dead and 200 were missing. So, an example where experts said it was not a good idea to do this, but the government went ahead um, and did it over the objections. And uh, the villagers were saying they had no idea what to anticipate um, and were totally unprepared. I've got that in a um, reference um, file I can make a note card out of and uh, give it to uh, Chantel. There was another example, and this time it was um, a successful example um, in California in the um, Santa Cruz Mountains. It was forecast that a river of air would come in. These used to be known as pineapple expresses. Um, but the, the river of air carrying a lot of moisture from the tropics into California would come in. The authorities um, evacuated about 5,000 people from the Santa Cruz mountain towns like Boulder Creek. Um, 
partly because there'd been fires up there, um, up near a um, park called Big Basin. Um, so they knew there'd be um, not as much foliage to absorb the rainfall and expected floods. And that was a good example of early warning followed by action. Now, at the um, recent January 25, 26 uh, climate adaption summit, that was one of the things, um, a session on risk management talked about was um, the need for early warning and the need for that early warning to lead to action because if you have an early warning and nothing happens, um, you might as well not have done the early warning. Um, it's sort of like driving down a, a a street and hitting a bump and then seeing a sign that said, you know, bump occurred. So what are the negative impacts? In, in thinking of adaption and, and risk reduction, we first got to identify um, what the different likelihoods for changes in climate um, uh, will be. You know, how probable is a severe uh, a given level of severe rainfall um, or winds, um, what will be the probability of um, high oceans, things like combining storms, uh, the rise in sea level with climate and um, uh, tides, for ex uh, example. So potential negative impacts on people are reduced water and food quality and supply. Um, one of the things I was reading on New York, which does have its own program of adaptation, um, uh, was having um, garbage holdings or garbage, I don't know if you'd call them reservoirs, uh, above the flood level, which seemed like an excellent idea. I think that would also hold for water treatment plants. Um, one impact is loss of lives. There, there were lo lives lost in the Himalaya flood episode and in the Texas um, cold event. Uh, loss of income and property. Uh, flooding and high sea levels, damage to human health, um, and in some cases, displacement. Um, New York, um, in their um, planning, uh, has a segment on buying up property that is expected to become uninhabitable. How to discount the future. Um, that gets into partially how often will an event occur. The, the event that used to occur one in a hundred years might have been tolerable, where if it's one in three years, um, it's intolerable. And a lot of this... Um, our social decisions. What's an what's an intolerable impact? Um, who's affected? Um, a lot of times, the people affected by climate change aren't the ones who benefited um, uh, from the release of CO two. Um, 
displacement, um, severe drought um, may require people to migrate. And that's a lot tougher now than it once was, simply because when they get to the border, they're going to face people with guns uh, who don't particularly welcome them. Um, so a nomadic lifestyle or moving from one place to another um, starts becoming a security issue. And the U.S. Department of Defense um, recognizes climate change as security issues. Um, it also recognizes climate change as a risk factor to um, military bases that some are in flood zones. Um, some maybe where desert, desertification is happening and um, or dr where drought is occurring. So the Department of Defense, Defense um, is much more receptive to um, adapting and mitigating um, effects of climate change than the country as a whole has been. Yes, insurance companies um, are very much interested in increasing risks um, because if they weren't, they're going to start losing money. So how can one um, work to prevent and respond to impacts? Um, again, this is from a slide by the International Federation of Red Cross and Red um, Crescent is public awareness, um, advocating for the most vulnerable, who often are the, the people who have the worst side effects um, or worst effects of climate change, um, disaster preparedness and response, improving laws and policy, water sanitation and hygiene promotion. One of the occurrences with the um, Texas power loss um, was that water supplies were also compromised. And I think it was 7 million people were under an advisory to boil the water, their tap water, before using it. Um, providing mental health counseling, shelter, community level skills and resources, early warning and forecast based action, um, and income loss assistance, which uh, certainly with the uh, COVID pandemic is one of those um, things that's been argued a lot and Surveys show that Republican voters and city officials are all pretty much in favor of um, receiving federal government money to um, supplement what they have and help them survive, while um, Congress is in the opposition mode. So a Congress that's out of touch with some of the voters in the same party. 
Um, in looking over documents on adaptation and uh, um, a lot of the writing was about the uh, science or evaluation or assessment stops with the effects of the science and hasn't gone into the um, type of risk assessment that decision makers need into um, uh, what can occur, how likely is it, um, what will be the consequences um, on the population, um, and what can be done um, what strategies can be used to um, mitigate the effects, not a, which is different than mitigating the climate warming. Mitigating the climate warming has to do with going to renewable energy and carbon neutral energy production. Mitigating the effects is um, adaptation um, to what's happening at any level. So, one of the papers said the, the consequences of physical climate science paying little attention to the needs of risk assessment has been that important issues have been neglected. One consequence has been to um, afford insufficient attention to the low likelihood, high impact events um, that, as already discussed, are a central concern in risk um, assessment. And I think the Texas event could be categorized in that, at least as far as we know, it's still low likelihood, but the impact was huge. Climate uncertainty um, has been in, used as an excuse for doing nothing, but that's um, scientifically the wrong way of looking at it um, because greater uncertainty um, increases the likelihood of um, a large effect of climate change, even if the uh, probability is low. Um, so uncertainty can be a source of um, actionable knowledge, something to um, spur on. How can we ensure that um, no matter what happens within a reasonably finite probability uh, that the effects won't be catastrophic? So when we talk about risk, um, one of the um, uh, simplest ways of looking at it is the loss or gain of something of value. Um, and that something of value is um, one of the sticky points because that's a um, imprecise social evaluation and different people will um, look at it uh, differently. For instance, some unfortunately look at the loss of life in um, uh, third world countries as um, not something of value. Um, however, um, there are local efforts happening in Africa, for instance, um, to mitigate against the effects of flooding or drought. So there's a large amount of social, political, and economic analysis um, 
of observed and projected climate impacts um, that aren't straight probability. Um, there's a physical climate system and the effects may cover a range of probabilities. And then there's the social impacts from what happens um, also covering um, a range of probabilities for, in a sense, each probability of the physical change. Decision makers need to understand how climate change may interfere with their plans and compromise their objectives so they can adapt existing policies and adopt new strategies to stay on track. Whether to protect life, health, and well-being, sustain economic growth, preserve natural resources, ensure continued performance of critical infrastructures, or maintain national security. Um, so definitely a complex problem. Um, core principles of risk assessment um, adapted from a paper by uh, King et al. in 2013, 2015. Define what we value. What is at risk? Make the, uh, this transparent and put these things, people, human systems, uh, valued natural systems and surfaces front and center in the assessment. Risk analysis inevitably involves definitions of valued outcomes that reflect particular ethical or political interests. Open deliberation is required to define relevant values that are acceptable to all stakeholders. And then step two, define what we wish to avoid with respect to these valued things. For example, thresholds of performance, um, viability, house uh, losses and damages, what keeps you up at night? Carry out analyses to identify what risky outcomes are possible cannot be ruled out. Starting with the biggest um, ones, in such analyses, it is useful to distinguish between two questions. What is most likely to happen and how bad could things get? Other important questions include what methods and tools are available to manage those risks? What efforts are needed? over short versus long time scales and by when are likely are we likely to have additional information that may change our risk perceptions and our decisions um, and then distinguish between direct risks that deal with individual impacts resulting from a given change in climate and might be the targets of adaptation actions at local and regional scales and systematic risks that relate to major potentially interconnected failures across multiple regions or uh, sectors and thus um, provide important um, motivation for adaptation and migration and mitigation actions at larger scales. Um, Certainly, um, Texas had not evaluated correctly the um, how bad could it get because it got a lot worse than was anticipated. Um, it's interesting in the uh, Climate Adaptation Summit, um, a good part of the discussion was on local action. Um, New York has its own local action. Um, interestingly, um, Southern Florida, city of Miami, uh, Miami and uh, uh, county actions are acting to 
mitigate um, effects with no help from the state and federal government, um, at least in the past four years. So um, there's a consortium, I think, of 100 cities um, working on adapting to climate change. So drawing on core principles um, suggested three areas of um, climate change assessment, starting with a decision focus, improving quantification of key risks relevant to users' needs, and presenting risk um, information strategically, um, basically creating a framework um, that will be understood by those needing to make decisions. The social construct of value is a core risk assessment, um, and values are inherently subjective, come in many forms, um, economic, psychological, and otherwise, and can be challenging to quantify. Uh, metrics of value pertain to life, well-being, prosperity, um, ecosystem, prosperity, natural um, capital, and economic services, cultural heritage, and other qualities. Um, one of the things also discussed in the um, Climate Adaption Summit was the use of um, nature, what nature provides to help mitigate. Um, for instance, one of the counties in South Florida was um, planting magnolias um, to um, protect the park, um, basically using the magnolias as um, surge protectors, ocean surge protectors. I think that's... Um, about what I have for today and any particular questions. I do have a um, um, a page of references already that I just need to uh, cut and paste into a note card. <laughs>